Um, so we are now in session. Um, our meeting will be streamed on the White House website where you can submit questions. We won't be answering questions uh, during the meeting today, but we will periodically post responses to the questions. We've got quite a bit to get done today, so thank you for your patience as we um, get ready to move forward with the public meeting. Uh, we don't have scheduled breaks on the agenda, uh, but if you do need to take a break, please feel free to uh, get up as needed. Um, and with that, I, I will be keeping us very firm to our time on the agenda because there is so much to cover, so I apologize if that appears rude, um, but want to let you know that up front. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Patty, our chair. Good. Well, you have your, the agenda in front of you, but I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes grounding us in our mandate from the President. Um, after our last meeting where we were kicked off, we all have gone back and reviewed this mandate, and I think it's important to begin each meeting kind of sitting in this challenge. And our mandate is as stated. We identify the key attributes of effective community developed solutions, make recommendations on how to engage individuals, sectors, all hands on deck, and make re recommendations regarding specific policy areas, and identify and highlight what works. Now, this is the specific language, and you all have the details of the mandate from the President. And what we have uh, agreed upon is that in order to fulfill that mandate, there are two streams of responsibility. One is, as the President's mandate says, to identify what works in all communities, what can be done in all communities. And secondly, we chose as a council to take that wisdom of what works in every American community to create great change and apply that very specifically to an issue we all found was a pressing one for this administration, a pressing one for the people in this room, and a pressing one for every community. And that was the issue of disconnected youth. And we're going to spend a significant amount of time today um, uh, on the challenge of, of what have we learned as we've gone out and um, addressed community leaders, youth, um, those who serve youth and understand what are the issues related to our second goal, our second vision, which is every American community understanding the urgency, having the tools, and building the process and capacity to move their youth along critical pathways to education, employment, and ongoing civic participation. And I would, I would uh, remind you of the old adage that first be a pupil, then be a teacher. And uh, while we don't have the responsibility of being the teacher, this mandate from the president of making recommendations is as important, I think, if not more important as that role. So we have spent the last three months being students and now need to move in the coming three months into that role of beginning to make recommendations uh, to the president on both of these issues, every American community having the knowledge and tools at hand to create successful local collaboratives and every American community prepared to address these needs of youth. So our goal is to share what we've learned uh, and uh, we have an administrative session this afternoon to start to detail our work going forward uh, that should come out of those learnings. In your binder, in your slides, you'll see a summary of the key 2011 activities. Obviously, this council continues for the two-year term of that mandate. Uh, but knowing that all of these kinds of processes, you begin and learn and begin and learn and, and revise accordingly, we've uh, begun to get pretty specific about 2011, but I'm hoping even today we begin to get more of a sense of what will drive us through 2012. We spoke just a bit informally about the challenges of our first few months, but I want to be open about that. An enormous part of our learning has happened in the last 40 days. So some of the things that I'm going to hear in this meeting, I'll be hearing for the first time. We want to keep it dynamic and really uh, learn from each other, and we won't finish our learning until uh, we finish this council. But this deep dive of learning um, uh, has really happened largely 
in the last 30 to 40 days. And, and I think some of it continues as early as Monday, right? There's another uh, listening session there. Um, and then, but we need to move this summer, as we said, to developing the business cases, developing potential calls to action, developing preliminary recommendations to the White House so that we know that our uh, findings and our potential calls to action align and are specifically what the President and the White House would have us have us do to drive these issues forward. Again, with the, with the goal of a real launch of our activities sometime this fall, and as you all know, we meet again in October. But there will be quite a bit of work this summer to get this preliminary set of recommendations to the White House um, and uh, um, begin to um, uh, really map out what the fall's activities will be. And I won't go through these two tables about the work underway, because it was in your pre-reading, um, and all of you have been very involved in the work groups, but I would point you to unnumbered slide. Arthurine, what slide is this? In their books? Okay, slide 12 and 13 are a bit of a recap of the activities underway, but because we're going to be diving much further into those, I don't think we need to, to re repeat those. Um, so again, today's goal is uh, listening and learning, and the, our, first, um, our first listening will be <laughs> to Melody Barnes, who we are expecting any, any minute now, right? <laughs> who is the director of the Domestic Policy Council, and happy to tell you that she has been a constant uh, leadership and presence in, in uh, our efforts uh, through these past months and continues to be. Um, but while we wait for Melody, um, perhaps we could just update a bit on who has been to which sessions. Um, I know I know that almost everyone has been able to participate in some sessions. Scott. You, you were leader in the New Orleans listening session? We did the New Orleans uh, sessions. Uh, Michael Kempner was able to join us, as well as Michael Fleming was able to join us for part of it. That's good. And Jim, your Cincinnati efforts? Uh, Cincinnati. We had uh, uh, involvement from uh, Paul Schmitz and John Bridgeland and Bill Strickland. So we had some pretty good engagement there. And um, uh, uh, you want and then, um, what did, what did, Michael, you want to talk a little bit about some of the other sessions that you've been in? Well, no, we'll go through them in detail, but in terms of who was able to, uh, um, who, has anybody else been able to participate in the, obviously, they're led obviously by John. Obviously, yeah, Jeffries. I mean, uh, so we had Scott, we had, uh, obviously, John um, has been at all of them, myself, uh, where's Wendy, is Wendy in there? Wendy, obviously, was the all-star um, in, in Atlanta and actually, in many ways changed my life so we had a uh, we had a great session down there and um, who do we have coming with us in, on Monday Bill, Bill Strickland okay, great. Um, that's right and um, then for the, the expert listening session yes for you want to do the buttons there on turn your red button on uh, right and then we had um, uh, a number of uh, expert uh, listening sessions that a number of uh, members of the effectiveness team participated in as well that were terrific so, and then San Francisco, um, I, uh, she's way over in the corner, Bobby. <laughs> I kept scanning and I couldn't get back. So. so San Francisco, we had, uh, we had five listening sessions and participating in the session, uh, Jim Canales and I were co-hosting that and Paula came from Seattle, flew down to San Francisco. We had Maurice Miller and then Michael Fleming flew up from Los Angeles. So we had a very robust discussion um, over a day and a half, it was terrific. That's great. And so I know that Diana V was able to join some of our stakeholder listening here. Um, we've just really had, um, and then Nancy actually went out on the road and went to Portland with some of the um, funders funders transition push, push the button. I went to the funders transition network, which was a gathering of all the foundations funding work like ours. So a piece of the whole. Yeah. The. Uh, um, the challenge, of course, is we're at 250 and climbing, and um, the diversity of voices, the diversity of effort, um, the differences community to community are really, uh, are really quite remarkable, and we could spend the full two years of this council 
continuing to deepen our understanding through listening to those who are on the on the front line. But it's really been quite remarkable what we've what we've learned thus far. And I understand that Melody's on her way, and um, the the morning staff sessions are quite <laughs> intense and important. So we're glad that she's able to to join us for this. Um, any questions about our agenda for today? While we wait for Melody. Come on, guys. You know, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Patty, I have. I, I can probably, if, if we think Thank Melody you, will be here in just a few minutes, uh, and given the setting the context for these listening sessions, uh, when we actually give our group's presentation, uh, I can maybe take some of that time now that I don't think would disrupt the meeting and, and take two minutes to just uh, say some things that I would probably say at the beginning of that, Good. if that would Please. be helpful for Please. right now. Well, so it, when Patty talked about the listening sessions and uh, the level of engagement, I, I, I really do want to uh, really do want to thank Scott and Bobby and Jim and Michael and John. Uh, the level of work that had to go into preparing these sessions uh, at, w with the council members and staff members like Wendy uh, Copeland and Megan and uh, Stephanie was pretty extraordinary uh, in terms of both thoughtfulness and time commitment. And uh, these sessions uh, really came together in a pretty powerful way. Uh, but when you look at it and you look at the number of council members that engaged, and we'll talk through the kind of the themes and the learnings, but the sidebar that I did want to mention uh, was really the enthusiasm from communities in terms of, of one, a bit of recognition, because to be heard from is, is a level of recognition. But, you know, the value and the notion of being heard was probably one of the more extraordinary uh, learnings and uh, feelings from my vantage point in terms of what we've, what we've done. And I wanted to, you know, tee up my later comments with, with that thought and thank those leaders for their time and their efforts and uh, it really did play well with what you started here in terms of the engagement so thank you to all of the leaders that really engaged in that process good 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 there's a, a quote from diane sawyer that that uh that that came to mind several times as i saw the feedback coming in and and it's a simple one uh she says i think the one lesson i have learned is there's no substitute for paying attention <laughs> and uh i i think the 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 deepened commitment as well as wisdom we've gotten by paying attention these last few months to what's going on out in communities has really been remarkable. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, oh, Melody. Great. Melody Barnes has, has uh, uh, as you know, provided leadership for our efforts from her role as leader of the Domestic Policy Council. Great. Oh, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you again, and welcome back to the White House. Um, sorry I was running a few minutes late. It's hard to believe by, what, 8.50, you've already had a couple of meetings. Um, <laughs> so we have our senior staff meetings in the morning. Um, but again, I want to thank you for all the work that you've been doing, and welcome you back, and in particular, also thank Patty. I mean, we always say around here, you know, if we know we've got Patty in the leadership, it'll get done um, exactly um, so thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and I know how incredibly busy you all have been um, because I've been hearing from various colleagues in the White House um, who have been hearing from you and also just the work that you've been doing in the field it was great to come in and hear Jim talking about the listening sessions um, because one of the things I wanted to say that we really appreciate is the fact that you all are out in community um, and I completely agree with you that uh, listening and being present in community is a reflection, I think, of respect for people and for the work they're doing, but also the level of importance of the work that's being done, and that's what this is really all about. Um, so thank you for that and for being our eyes and our ears and extending our reach outside the 18 acres here into communities around the country. Um, that's really very valuable. Um, to us, and it's certainly very important to the President and to the First Lady, and you know that from the First Lady being here for the first meeting that you all had. Um, and the other thing I would say, I mentioned the morning meetings that we had. I was briefing very briefly the Chief of Staff and the other senior staff 
um, this morning about the fact that you were having your second meeting, the kind of work that you've been doing, and using this lens of disconnected youth to focus on community solutions, um, which was something that people were interested in, and particularly the way that it connects with the president's agenda, and actually particularly right now. I mean, we've had a period of several months where we, for various reasons, have had a very intensive focus overseas and on our foreign policy issues, which obviously will continue. It's a big world. There's always something going on out there. But at the same time, he's really going to be intensifying his work domestically, particularly over the, the course of the next several months. And the economy, obviously very specifically, but really setting the table more broadly and talking about the work that we're doing domestically writ large. So this focus on jobs, the focus on education, particularly focusing on this group, this targeted group of disconnected youth, is very, very closely aligned to what he's going to be doing, what he's going to be talking about and focusing on um, intensely um, over the next several months, but obviously for the months and for the years to come. So that will be very, very helpful um, to us, and we're anxious to hear more about what you've been learning about and what you'll be doing um, to build on the listening sessions um, thus far. Um, and also, I think the fact that the other thing I'll mention is that people are excited because we've had uh, some other successful councils um, that have operated over the last couple of years and the recommendations that they've been able to bring back, the ideas and the work they've been able to bring back to the White House that we've been able to execute on across the administration has really been very valuable and very well received. So we're excited about that as well. And I will just close by uh, mentioning CNCS in particular and wanting to thank Leslie um, for her work over the last three months. I know she really jumped in. Um, I know in talking to Patty um, how well she's been doing in, in her new role, so thank you for that. Um, and also, I know you're going to be meeting with Ro Robert Velasco later on today, who stepped in as the acting CEO um, for the corporation since Patrick um, stepped down just about a week ago. So I'm excited that you all have an opportunity to spend some time with him, to ask him some questions. I know that you all will welcome him and look forward to working with him. I mean, he's a very, very capable manager um, and someone who has a deep passion for these set, this set of issues and national service in general. So I look forward to having you all have a chance to engage with him um, in the months to come in, in this new capacity that he's taking until we uh, nominate a new person to lead the corporation. So thank you very, very much. And I have yet another meeting to go to in a couple of minutes. Um, but I don't know if there are any questions um, that anyone has. I'm happy to, to do that, or if you all want to move forward with your agenda either way. Um, questions for, for Melody that relate specifically to this intersection of the President's agenda and, and our work? Um, you know, Byron, from the standpoint of the effectiveness group, is there anything that's on your mind that way? Uh, well, I guess one of the things um, uh, uh, on our mind is how the um, how disconnected youth fit into the broader uh, jobs mm -hmm. agenda because of course um, there's a there's a much broader uh, need for job creation in the country and I know that's a big focus of the administration and so if there's any thoughts on on how the the youth segment that is you know it's at such a pivotal point in their lives and getting into the labor market and getting some experience you know how should we think about bringing those together sure. Um, you know, I, I, to your point that it is such a pivotal point in the life of a young person and how they're going to root and anchor themselves into society more broadly. Um, and either it can be a positive um, and connecting experience or point in time, or it can be that point in time where things really go awry. And this is an area that the President, I think, personally cares very deeply about. But we recognize as we are trying to move the needle on the economy generally and on the jobs as a general matter, and, and you know, jobs numbers um, come out have come out um, today, that this is an area that needs intensive focus. And I think Patty and I also had the opportunity um, to speak um, to a group of funders a few months ago um, who are looking at, at this um, set of issues. And it's one of the things that we recognize that you can help us bring kind of that laser-like focus on as we're thinking about jobs more generally, as we're thinking about some of the tools that we've brought to bear in the education sector, um, not only thinking about K through 12 and the dropout set of issues, which is an important um, and significant component of this, but also how do we better connect you to an educational experience that will help them better lash up to 
a set of skills and a job um, experience um, that will be a positive one for them. So we've put a lot of things in place, but we've done that at the federal level and, uh, and federal policy setting. What sits underneath that and is happening in communities, I th we think can better bolster that. Um, so I think looking at some of the things and thinking about some of the things that we've done um, and the framework we've put in place both in education um, and the work that we've done over the past two years, um, thinking about the, the different tools for youth, you know, Youth Corps and other, other kinds of institutions and how we can leverage that through community solutions will be a very important tool set of tools for us um, as we want to focus laser-like on this particular um, cohort of young Americans. Very good. Very good. Well, um, much of the work that we're going to be, uh, the learnings that we're going to be talking about today are about what are the obstacles facing those youth and as we begin to identify things that are both policy and or uh, recommendations based on that, we, we're counting on, uh, on the DPC to, to, uh, to really help us with these recommendations and identify how the different work going on across the administration, across the uh, federal government can really <coughs> spur change. So right. we, we appreciate that. We appreciate your, I, I said this before you got here, but we appreciate your constancy of leadership. It's typical to have a lot of leadership changes at this point, and one of the mm -hmm. things that's been so wonderful is um, that, you know, from the moment we first started talking about this council, or the moment you first started talking about this council to today, your constant uh, accessibility and leadership has been a big part of us getting as far as we've gotten. So. Good. Thank you, Melody. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good. Well, we shall let her go to her next meeting. <laughs> yeah, probably like 12 of them today. So. <laughs> so good. Thank you. And, and move very specifically uh, to some of the findings that the effectiveness group has done. Uh, I said it was important to be the pupil before the teacher, and they really started uh, with what of all the other um, uh, what is, what is the rest of the nation, the rest of the um, uh, research and the learnings that are already out there? And I, I think this will be a very interesting discussion. I've asked uh, not just Byron, but all of the work group leaders to try to take uh, uh, the approach that while we have lots to present, we are all pupils and want to discuss. And so we're looking for about a 50-50 mix with about 30 minutes for this next presentation, about half of it spent in dialogue about our own lens and what we see and are learning from the information that Byron and his team brings forward. So Byron? Terrific. Thanks, Patty. So um, uh, the presentation that, that we'll be giving over the next few minutes um, uh, aims to give an overview of uh, the number of disconnected young people in the U.S. today, some of the, the barriers that keep them out of work and school, um, and then some of the solutions that, that seem uh, promising. Um, and before we get started on that, I do want to say that um, we have benefited uh, tremendously from a wide range of, of academic experts, of practitioners, of community leaders, and of young people themselves. Um, they've given really generously of their, of their time and their insights and their experiences. And while we can't uh, thank them uh, by name in this presentation, we are really grateful, really grateful for their, their input. Um, I, I would also note that they don't all agree with each other, and that this is a very um, this is a very complex uh, issue, and um, and uh, some of what you're going to present is sort of is uh, an attempt to kind of get to the the essence of things, and hopefully we won't do uh, too much damage to the complexity of the issue while trying to get to really the the, the heart of the matter, and uh, and I would just add that. Uh, what we've seen is that the, there's, there really is a, a tremendous need for more research and better data in this, in this field. Um, and it's an incredibly important issue. As Melody was talking about, this is, this is the pivotal moment in a, in, a, in a young person's life and an American's life when they have a chance to really connect to all the great things that this country has to, to offer and to make the most of, 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 of their uh, of their, their talents, and it's such a critical time, um, we need to understand it better, and we need to understand for, for those young people who are, are, are not, or who are struggling to make that, that transition, um, how they can, uh, can get more of a boost. So, um, let me see here. Ah, rolling, great. All right, so we'll be talking about um, four or five <coughs> things. First, I'm going to very quickly um, uh, cover some of the, the pretty rapid changes in, in the American 
labor market that are making um, education and job skills more important than ever uh, for young people. And also um, to give a picture of the roughly three to four million young people who are, who are at any one point temporarily, or we hope temporarily, disconnected from education or work. And then uh, Jill Schumann uh, will be uh, talking about the different types of barriers that, um, that confront uh, disconnected young people and offer a bit of a, a segmentation for how to think about this group, uh, as well as then some of the elements of solutions that are different by segment and some that are um, in common. And then finally, uh, Michelle Jolin will be sharing some, some uh, initial lessons about what we're learning about community collaboratives as we start to connect the dots between our, uh, our topic of disconnected youth and the community collaborative approach that we think is so, so promising. So um, one of the things um, that we're seeing, um, and uh, uh, Tony Carnevale and many others have, have pointed to this, the U.S. labor market is really demanding uh, more um, higher order skills and more post-secondary education. So um, you know, in 1973, really only about 28 percent of American jobs required any post-secondary education at all, and almost a third of the workforce had dropped out of high school, and yet they were in the workforce. They had, they had jobs. Um, as we roll that tape forward, um, that's already changed quite a bit, but as you roll forward to, say, uh, 2018, the projections are that 63 percent of the workforce, you know, versus 28 percent back in 1973, will have to have at least some post-secondary education. So it's going to make it harder and harder for, for young people um, without uh, this, this kind of education to make themselves attractive candidates for jobs. So that's where we're headed, and as you can see, we're pretty far along that path already. Um, that said, um, the, the need for post-secondary education does not mean that everyone needs to get a four-year college degree. Uh, the good news is that there, there are multiple pathways for young people to, to be successful and successfully connect, including apprenticeships, various training programs, associate's degrees, um, and a four-year degree is just one of those pathways. Uh, and in fact, um, two-thirds of the jobs today don't require a four-year degree and with the appropriate uh, certificate or, or licensing. Um, uh, uh, folks can get into that market. Um, uh, I would say that um, uh, the bad news is that um, unlike some countries that have thought and, and built systems that more systematically connect uh, young people in those countries to other opportunities besides four-year degrees. Um, the U U.S., while it has a lot of opportunities um, to these pathways, it doesn't really have a system. It has a patchy system or even a non-system um, outside of the four-year degrees. And this is something that will be important to, to strengthen. So um, uh, it's, uh, the data is not um, that great, to be honest, and we need better data. But roughly, and there's been a number of studies, roughly three to four million uh, young people, age 16 to 24, are disconnected both from the labor market um, and from uh, school. So there are quite a few young people struggling to make this this connection. <coughs> and um, you know, it's it's certainly true that most young people are able to make this uh, this connection. So that's the good news, and I think. Um, we are, um, uh, I mean, our perspective is that uh, there's actually a, a tremendous amount of, of talent and potential um, that's being kind of caught up, unfortunately, in these difficult transitions and then some that, that don't really make the transition successfully. And that's not evenly distributed through the population, as we can see here. Um, actually, interestingly, this group is um, uh, a bit more uh, female than the general population. Um, uh, it is uh, disproportionately, um, uh, disproportionately African American and Hispanic, although um, uh, by far the, the, the majority of, of disconnected youth um, are, are not minorities. And what we certainly see is that uh, high school or less is, the, is absolutely the dominant um, educational Jim, can I, can characteristic. I, can I ask a question for a second? Mm -hmm. um, in the listening tours, you know, there are only a few, but in a handful of sample and all of the, almost all of the young people we spoke to had either been in jail, prison, homeless. Um, so he says it doesn't include those people. Uh, do we know the numbers are like when you include that population? Because almost all the successful kids we met with 
at some point had been homeless or in prison. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the numbers have been cut a variety of different ways. I think um, there certainly it includes a lot of people who spend time um, as homeless or who have been in prison or with uh, uh, in uh, 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 you know uh, in uh, part of uh, the the juvenile justice system, for example. How, however, uh, there are there are actually quite a lot of of young people in this group um, who are not in that situation at the moment. I mean, I think that one of the things that you see is that there's just a tremendous um, instability in the lives of a lot of these young people. So they, many of them have been touched by. But by, I, I just uh, be curious to know how many you know are not being counted because you know at any given time are there. 50,000, 100,000, 500,000, I have no idea what the numbers would be of people, of young people that, that will then come back, enter the system somehow, that have gone through, that have either been homeless or, or either currently homeless or in prison. I have no idea what that number would be. Yeah, I don't know what that number is offhand, but, but there's definitely, um, I, I mean, I think the number that are sort of coming in and out um, from the criminal justice system is a, is a significant, it's a significant number. Byron, I, yes. I have also have a follow-up question. Um, mm -hmm. For clarification, how does this group differ from what we would call unemployed and reported in labor statistics? Right. So this group includes not only um, uh, people who are who are listed as unemployed. Those are people who are actively um, searching, actively searching for work and in the labor market, but but not employed. It includes many that are. Um, that are counted that are that are not in the labor market. They're discouraged uh, workers or those who are um, yeah, maybe in in the informal sector and so forth. So there's actually um, quite a lot of of this group that's not in the unemployment so, statistics. So it, it is a broader definition. Some people were unemployed, may, may be in this group. Some people may not be in this group. Well, they're not. Um, so everyone in this group is not working. Right. They're not employed, but that's not the same as being unemployed, like in the sort of the unemployment statistics are only people who are not working but who are actively looking for work or are listed as actively looking for work. Those who are not working at, and, and not actively looking for work or are discouraged because they don't see the prospects, they are also counted in this number. Let me, let me do one little bit of uh, just process clarification. When we have an issue like um, Michael's on the current jail population, how many additional kids would mm -hmm. that be? We'll do follow up very quickly with the support of our, our team at the uh, corporation and get those numbers back into the discussion. So, thanks, Patty. Um, and then the um, uh, then the last slide I want to show before handing it over to to Jill um, is looking at the uh, some of the other uh, uh, social characteristics. So as you can see, um, more than uh, a quarter of disconnected youth have annual household incomes of less than $15,000 a year, um, which is roughly the poverty threshold um, for a two-person uh, family. Um, I, I would observe that that means that actually uh, the majority of disconnected youth are living above the, the, the poverty line. So this is not just a problem of, the, of, the, of very poor people in this country. <laughs> So, uh, okay. Um, another question, or two actually. One is, uh, over time, have these numbers changed and in what direction? And secondly, uh, in what way has the economy in, of the last couple of uh, three or four years affected this group as compared with the adult discouraged population? Well, in the spirit of Patty's comments, I won't try to give exact numbers, but I would say in general, um, the, the share of young people working um, is, at a, is at a very low level relative to uh, historic levels. Those who are not in education, um, the, the rate of uh, labor force participation um, is, is at a, I think it's at a post-war low now. Now this is, um, there are other groups, um, uh, uh, sort of men, Adult, uh, older than, than this group, um, for example, men without um, any post-secondary education or not high school graduates whose employment labor force participation is also at historically low levels. And so um, that's partly uh, the, the, the Great Recession that we've had, but it's, but it's actually been a trend uh, that's been moving in that direction for about 20 years now. So it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not just a one-time recession-driven thing. 
OK. So with that, I'd like to um, hand it over to Jill. We'll be talking a bit more about the, the segmentation. Great. Let's see if I can, there we go. I'll just put them all in. There we go. Well, we know that, for example, that all of these young adults in transition are not homogeneous. They're really quite different. And as the council, uh, or the effectiveness group, was trying to get a handle on these young people, um, we found that there are lots of different ways that people segment them and identify lots of subgroups. The challenge, I think, for this group is because we're looking for solutions, we want to find fairly simple ways of subgrouping them without doing violence, as uh, Brian said earlier, to the complexity. We understand that uh, we'll, by definition, be at a fairly high level here. And we thought about, um, certainly, these young people around the barriers that they face, knowing that it's really their strengths and their assets that it is that we want to engage and put on the table. But in order to figure out solutions, we also had to look at the barriers. And we thought that there really are two kinds of barriers. One is the degree of preparation for the workforce. We know that some young people are relatively well prepared to enter the workforce. They have high school uh, diplomas. They've completed GEDs. They have some uh, credentials or skills. And others really need more education or work training before they have marketable skills. And we know, for example, that there are any number of people who actually are, have graduated from high school who are functionally not literate. And we know that other folks lack even the most basic kinds of credentials. So one piece is their preparedness to enter the workforce. The other variable really is their ability to kind of take up the opportunities. And we know that some of these young people are able to take up the opportunities if there are some smoothing of the on-ramps. They have reasonable um, home situations. They don't have major survival challenges. And so for them, uh, the opportunity, the ability to take up the opportunity is a little higher. We also know, though, that there are lots of these young people who face enormous barriers to being able to take up the opportunities. They might be full-time caregivers, young moms, or they have juvenile justice histories, adult correctional system um, engagement, that sort of thing. So we think there are two essential axes. One is ability to take up the education, and the other is their preparedness. We think that, in fact, then, we could take those two variables and make a matrix and, um, in a sense, define a few large subgroups. This, I think, dovetails well with the work of the capacity group. As I read their um, materials, I think we'll find some of those same things. We've provided some very rough estimates of the size of these groups, but truly, a lot of this research uh, doesn't exist. Trying to figure mm -hmm. out how to bucket these folks is more complex, I think, than most of the research would suggest. The first group, the ones in the A column, we um, would suggest that these are the folks that have a high school or a better education and don't report a specific barrier uh, educationally that keeps them out of the employment system. And we think that these are folks that have the ability fairly readily to connect to work and they have um, probably a need some assistance with being able to um, get the career skills to keep a job and also to progress to a living wage. The second group, which is B, we would say has less than a high school education and don't report a specific barrier that keeps them out of school or work. Again, these folks seem to be mismatched with the education system. In other words, they can't seem to get the right educational opportunities or the opportunities don't work for them. And again, thinking that that's a fairly small segment of the um, disconnected youth population. The third group, C, are really in the opposite situation. They have completed high school or have other kinds of marketable credentials, but have other kinds of challenges that keep them out of work or education, such as family responsibilities, disabilities, barriers that are not so much educational as they are about their personal situations. And then finally, this last group, D, 
really faces multiple hurdles. They um, are underprepared and they have challenges that keep them out of work or school. And we think, again, that the, these folks that have personal barriers are by far the largest segment of the young adults in transition. Uh, quick question. Where, how did you extrapolate the numbers for each of these buckets? Um, so the, the work on the numbers uh, was done off of the current population survey. That's the, the main uh, data source, and it has to do um, uh, on the educational side, um, it has to do with educational credentials, um, sort of a GED or high school. What it doesn't fully account for is uh, our folks who have those credentials but don't, in fact, have the skills, right, that who sort of graduated from high school but have very low levels of literacy. So if you take that into account, that bottom right, the mismatch with the education system might actually be a bit bigger, in fact. But then, and then uh, the current population survey also reported on things like are they, um, uh, do, are they a single mom and that, that sort of thing, these various barriers, criminal uh, history and so forth. Right. And we know that each of these, um, the, the young people in each of these groups really faces a different set of barriers. Uh, for example, group A, which is mismatched with the employment system, may be struggling with, um, as Byron just said, having the wrong credentials, not um, having the kinds of jobs available in their community, that sort of thing. For Group C, on the other hand, um, some of the things that they're dealing with are likely things like criminal histories, caregiving commitments. Uh, we've heard from an, any number of uh, folks that are working with young people the challenge of stability and how many of these folks are what they call couch surfing. I mean, they're going from friend to friend to friend, um, and the barriers then of education um, are, are difficult, certainly transportation. The instability is really a challenge. And then thinking really about disconnected youth like this helps us to get a picture of the kinds of solutions that might work and also to make sure that we're not simply targeting t solutions to one group or another. I think we know that it's important to think broadly because um, often the programs and funding streams are narrow. So we certainly want um, to make sure that we're dealing with whole people. We've done a little bit of this work for all four of this uh, quadrants, but we'll just take a couple as examples. For example, if you looked at the folks that are mismatched with the education system, we know that um, these are the folks who aren't reporting a barrier that keeps them out of work, but they haven't completed high school. And so we think that this is a place where working on the education system and the opportunities for education would really be important. Um, we think can see here are some of the things that are barriers. Again, these are just examples. And we would say that first priorities for these folks are some basic skills remediations, alternative pathways, flexible hours, those kinds of things. If you look at the next group, which is, um, again, just another example, the folks that face non-work and non-education obstacles, we can see that there are different sorts of solutions that might be needed for these folks. We know that um, these folks, for example, have multiple challenges and need supportive services at the same time that they're being moved into the workforce. They're going to need other kinds of supports in order to do that. In a survey of what looks successful, Again, I think folks have done a pretty good literature review here. Um, the most effective programs, and again, this seems to square with what the capacity building folks were hearing in their sessions, they seem to have some things in common. Um, some of the things that they have in common really are the need to look at whole people. They should address programs, should be connected enough that many of the uh, young people's issues can get dealt with at the same time. We know that the programs should be well designed uh, with strategies that focus on addressing the needs and making the connection to stable employment. We know that these organizations need to be effective with good staff members and have strong relationships in the community. And we know that the programs should specifically build on the strengths of young people, set high expectations, and really engage these folks 
in the whole process that these shouldn't be about young people they should be with and for young people but we also know that these programs face lots of challenges um, certainly not to say that these solutions are easy we know that at the programmatic level um, many of these folks these programs are under resourced and have long waiting lists they're not enough spaces for folks um, and in some cases uh, there are not rigorous questions about what are the outcomes is it the most effective way and the other is we know that many of these programs exist in silos they're fragmented and we know that in some cases it's actually the job markets that are mismatched to the youth and their opportunities and we know that there are some groups of young people that are particularly at risk especially folks like those who've been in the juvenile justice system or those who are transitioning out of foster care and i think then michelle is going to talk a little bit uh, about okay. Uh, before we move to Michelle, can I ask a question about about uh, the challenges that we found? Did we find a definitive? I, I know this for good purpose. We're using others' research on this. Did we find a good definitive piece about simply the financial resources that are uh, going to address these challenges? Because we identify that capacity is a very big. Uh, piece of it, but was there something so far that we've discovered that is the best financial recap? I don't think there's one financial recap. I think this is an extremely fragmented field, and you have to uh, piece together um, different views of it. It's actually quite quite difficult to get that total picture. There's certainly uh, we've not found one uh, piece of research that captures the whole uh, financing or resources available to address these issues. And even within the programs, most are putting together multiple funding streams. Yeah. Can I ask one question about, um, I, don't, I don't know if we dug into this, but just access to technology that these folks might have. I'm just thinking on the education side, like some of the blended learning approach that could make this scalable and more affordable. Any data on that in terms of education access? Well, at least in our small sample, again, we're talking about 50 or so kids, they are all very, very socially connected. That's where all they get their information is via the web. So, so whether they use it educationally, they have access to it uh, because it wasn't a. I mean, I actually interviewed almost all of them about how do they get their information. It's almost all internet based and a lot of it's social media. So they have the access, whether they're using it or not, I don't know. It just seems like that's such a huge avenue on the education side for scale. And, I, and I, I think the, the, um, the difference between technology access, as Michael was talking about, and blended learning is a pretty big difference because actually schools tend to be much less technology enabled than young people are in their own lives. Nancy, and then we'll move to Michelle. I just Michelle. want to underscore your question about the funding. For the national funders, they believe that one of the outcomes of our council might be a matrix on how to follow the funding and address the funding so that communities actually can get leverage and funders better understand how to create leverage from the various funding sources, which they believe are completely confused. Good. Uh, with that, let's transition to the second uh, arm of the effectiveness uh, research, which is on communities uh, and their collaboratives. Michelle? Good. Um, so I'm going to step back somewhat and focus more broadly on the issue of community collaboratives. Um, given that we see that as an important strategy for dealing with some of the issues that we talked about just now with disconnected youth. Um, and specifically, we're going to focus on um, promising examples of collaboratives. Um, we have a lot to learn. We're still pupils, as, as Patty said, but this will give you a sense of what we know so far. Um, so as Melody and Patty said, um, one of the key parts of our mandate of this council um, is going to be to identify examples of where communities have effectively moved the needle on a problem. And Paul talked about this at our last meeting um, and how critical that is to find um, examples where we're actually seeing, you know, measurable difference in, 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 um, in how problems are being solved. Um, we know there's many examples of nonprofits um, that are having that kind of impact, um, having resu seen results and getting um, an impact. Um, but these are more individual pockets of success as opposed to community-wide, um, you know, uh, impact and the community-wide change that we all want. Um, 
we know that there are fewer examples of effective community-wide efforts that have made a significant measurable difference on a problem across an entire community. Um, many communities have tried collaborations. I'm sure many of you have been part of collaborations, um, but they just haven't had the impact that we're hoping um, that we want and that we want to have. And that's for a variety of reasons. It's resources, it's um, time, it's infrastructure, data, outcomes, um, lack of focus on sort of measurable outcomes. Um, there's a variety of reasons, but it's safe to say that most of the collaborations haven't had the impact that we've, desire, have, that we've, that we've wanted and that we desire. Um, but despite this history and, and, and for some frustration with that, um, there have been a handful of next generation collaboratives, we're calling them, um, that are beginning to show some promise um, and do have the potential to have the kind of needle moving impact that we're hoping for. And it's these next generation collaboratives that we're going to focus on prim primarily. Um, we've heard in some of the listening sessions that you all took part in that, um, that community leaders are interested in understanding collaboratives better and having a better sense of how to have this kind of collaborative community-wide impact. Um, and these community leaders do recognize that some of the problems we're facing require this kind of concerted community-wide um, you know, effort with multiple sectors involved, multiple interventions. So there is this sort of demand and desire to get a better sense of how do we make this work better? How do we have um, a better sense of how to get collaborative action to work? So that's what we're gonna be focusing on um, as part of our um, effectiveness group um, subcommittee. We're looking at these kind of next generation collaboratives. Um, so what do we know so far? Um, what we know is um, that there are sort of six key um, common elements of these next generation collaboratives. Um, first, um, many of them have a strong shared vision. Um, sometimes it's been developed by a lead organization, sometimes it's been developed by a group of organizations, but overall there's sort of a generally, uh, in, in we see in these next generation collaboratives, a strong, widely shared vision. Um, second, we know that most of them have strong leadership. Um, and a sense of accountability to this leadership. Um, it's clear what the governance and accountability structure is and, and, and people are, are, are um, consistently um, reporting through these accountability systems about what their impact has been. Um, a third element is that um, the intervention tends to be broad. Um, the collaboration is not focused on just a single um, isolated intervention, but instead is more is more generally focused on sort of a broad set of interventions and a range of interventions. So that's sort of a third common element to these next generation collaboratives. Um, a fourth common element that we're seeing is um, shared metrics, common metrics, um, and that the, the, the data is actually being used to shape decision making. That it's not just data that's been collected. We've heard a lot from. Um, from uh, funders, from governments, that a lot of data is collected, but we're not actually using it to shape sort of how these collaboratives are, are working, how, um, how, what the impact is, and how things need to change to actually have the impact we're looking for. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's both the data and then it being used to sort of shape the, the decision making. A fifth um, common element of these next generation collaboratives um, is that there is a dedicated infrastructure, that there's a team of staff, there's people who um, this is their job to help support and drive this. It's not sort of um, done in someone's back pocket and among all the other things that need to be done, but it's, it's part of what their responsibility is um, day to day. Um, and then finally, um, and this is a really important point, is sufficient resources. Um, we all know that that's critical um, to long-term, big-scale, community-wide change. Um, but ideally, um, in successful instances, it, the local funders are engaged as well. It's not simply national funders, although that's important as well. But we need to see local funders, you know, specifically engaged in this. And there needs to be some flexibility in how these resources are used. It can't be that these are committed all in advance and we don't have, um, there's no flexibility to actually, you know, use these resources in ways that are responsive to what the collaboration um, is, is needing to do. Um, so these are kind of the, the, some of the early um, thinking on what some of the key elements are to these collaborations um, and why they might actually be different than some of the um, failed, you know, or, or past efforts that haven't had the impact that we wanted. Um, 
we also know that there's a number of challenges. These are sort of the common elements, but there's clearly challenges, and there's been a long history of frustration with how collaborations have, have, have worked. So we're going to be looking also closely at, you know, sort of what, what, why it hasn't worked, why collaborations have been um, uh, not as successful as we all would like. Um, so in terms of challenges, um, first, obviously, there needs to be a long-term commitment from relevant stakeholders. Um, change takes time. We know that change. Um, on a community-wide scale can take five years um, or more. Um, so effective collaborations need um, a significant long-term commitment of time, resources, and effort on the part of the stakeholders. And, the, and connected to that, the funders need to be patient as well. It can't be something that's seen as, um, you know, short-term investment. It's got to be a sort of a long-term investment in, in change and willing to invest for a longer period of time. Um, a second challenge in these... Yeah. Um, in these processes, I'm assuming it's, it's relatively a zero-sum game in terms of funding. Um, how have you looked at, and I would assume it is a daunting political task because there are some winners and there'll be some losers. Um, I would think that a, a big part of the problem is how, do, how does one overcome the objections of the losers or how do they take part in this process to make sure that they don't throw a effectively a monkey wrench into creating a, a bigger collaborative. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, something we need to look at, and I think okay. it's an important um, issue. And I, Paul may want to talk to that this afternoon when he's, when he's, because he's seen these work in Milwaukee and how they've, ha uh, they've happened. And I think one of the biggest challenges is this impression of it being a zero-sum um, uh, game that, you know, if, if funding is going to these, this collaboration, what's going to happen to sort of existing programs that may not be as focused on that? And, and I think at the local level, that's especially, especially you know, concerning because, um, you know, obviously programs at the local level, they're um, facing limited funding from limited funders, you know, a number of funders. Um, but that is something we'll look at. And I think Paul's going to be talking more about this this afternoon, so maybe we can also um, talk about that. That's a good point, though. Um, a second challenge um, is um, the need to align leaders at all levels and getting the right leaders in place. So um, the leaders um, in each of the institutions need to be engaged, need to be aligned, need to be um, uh, interested in participating and committed to participating in this. This means leaders at the head of the organizations. It means um, leaders in, in, at the grassroots. It means leaders at all levels need to be um, committed and part of this, and that can be um, a challenge in itself. It's also critical to get the right leader to coordinate the overall um, collaboration. Somebody who's an honest broker, um, somebody who's not seen as simply advocating for his or her own organization or, or, or particular interest. So it needs to be somebody who, um, you know, has that credibility and ability to um, kind of drive um, this process forward in, in a way that others can trust um, and they're acting on the collective interest. Um, a third challenge is that there needs to be a clear um, decision-making structure and a focus on accountability um, in order to keep the diverse stakeholders engaged and for them to feel like their time and resources are being used in a productive way. Um, it's obviously a, lot, a big commitment of time and resources and so to be um, you know, to be uh, doing this, in a, for people to be investing this much, that it needs to be um, uh, something that they see as productive. And then finally, there needs to be um, sort of substantial and regular community-wide engagement. Um, that means community, building community capacity, gathering community perspectives, and enlisting community leaders. Um, there's also... Um, several needs that were identified in our, in our listening sessions and our discussions, um, for needs that were identified by those who are actually doing these next generation collaboratives. Um, and I'm running out of time, but let me just quickly go through these because I think that it's important um, to uh, focus on this as part of why um, we'll be shaping what we're doing in the next um, phase of this work. Um, the leaders say that they need increased visibility and respect, um, credibility. Um, it's important to elevate the importance of these so that um, the um, funders and the leaders in these communities are invested in, the, in these collaboratives. Um, they're interested in certain policy changes um, that will make it easier for them to get their work done. They're interested in having an opportunity to share um, ideas and experiences with each other and examples around the country where these collaboratives are actually working. They're trying to learn from each other. 
and they're very interested in, in better technical assistance and helping build their capacity to operate more effectively. Um, they feel like they need that kind of support, um, given that they're in, in this sort of new territory and, and, and in, in a way learning, needing to learn from, um, from those who um, have done some of this before. Um, so these are just some of the, the initial thinking, you know, the initial insights we have about this. Um, and going forward, our plan is to focus very much on um, filling in some of the gaps, learning more about these collective um, action uh, collaboratives that are successful, um, and to get a better sense of what kind of tools and knowledge we can um, develop to help support these, to help advance them, to help accelerate the adoption of the collaboratives and then to figure out specifically what we can do using the assets we have as the White House Council um, to help these um, sit more successfully around the country.